morning, everybody. Um, glad you could be with us. Another Sunday of uh, virtual church. Uh, I know that some of our sister churches are starting to come back in this morning. Uh, we're going we're gonna to hang off on that just a little bit, just kind of see how everything shakes out, how everything plays out. We're going to get some feedback from the church, but uh, looking forward to being back together again soon. Um, this morning, we're going to be uh, pretty topical. I mean, this is this this is uh, the Sunday school lesson this morning is dead on with a lot of things that are going on in the world right now, and a lot of things that are going on in our state right now. Um, we're going to talk about religious liberty this morning. We're going to talk about uh, our relationship between Christian, the relationship between Christians and the government, and. Um, you know, there's a lot of things going on right now, John. You got churches suing the governor. Um, you got governors telling the churches, well, "You can't do this. You can't do this." There's a lot of interaction going on between the church and the state right now, and we're going to talk about this morning how we're supposed to relate to the state biblically as Christians and how we're supposed to interact. Um, this is a big topic for specifically Baptist churches because Baptist churches have been really the forerunners of religious liberty, the ones that really pushed religious liberty in, in, in our constitution and in our country. Uh, they really, really fought for it. Going all the way back into the 14 and the 1500s, uh, we, we, could, we could have a history lesson. If you want a history lesson, I wrote a blog post on this about a month ago that's on the Aberdeen Church website. One, one post gives a historical overview and the second post gives a biblical overview, more like what we're going to talk about this morning. But um, the Southern Baptist Convention actually addresses this and uh, they address it in the Baptist Faith and Message. And I'm going to read that this morning. Um, the section of the Baptist Faith and Message that talks about this. It's um, Article 17, Religious Liberty. God alone is Lord of the conscience. And we're going to talk about that conscience this morning. God alone is Lord of the conscience, and he has left it free from the doctrines and, con and commandments of men which are contrary to his word or not contained in it. Church and state should be separate. The state owes to every church protection and full freedom in the pursuit of its spiritual ends. In providing for each freedom, for such freedom, no ecclesiastical group or denomination should be favored by the state more than others. Civil government being ordained of God, it is the duty of Christians to render loyal obedience thereto in all things not contrary to the revealed will of God. The church should not resort to the civil power to carry on its work. The gospel of Christ contemplates spiritual means alone for the pursuit of its ends. The state has no right to impose penalties for religious opinions of any kind. The state has no right to impose taxes for the support of any form of religion. A free church in a free state is the Christian ideal, and this implies the right of free and, un and unhindered access to God on the part of all men, and the right to form and propagate opinions in the sphere of religion without interference by the civil power. So I, I, that's that's what the Baptist faith and message has to say about it. That's what we believe in this church. That's something that we have affirmed in this church in a business meeting. And, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning. That's what we're going to teach this morning. So getting started, I'm going to let John take off for a little bit. And, and we're going to go back and forth this morning like we always do. So, John, go ahead. All right, thanks, Daniel. Uh, appreciate that. And I uh, want to encourage everyone, as with any lesson, to uh, seek out uh, the Word and, uh, and study for yourself what we say today. And we try uh, our best to present the Word uh, and the teachings that, are, that we find in the Word, and we try to, to eliminate opinion as much as we can. Uh, however, uh, with that said, you'll get some opinion uh, from Daniel. You'll get some opinion uh, from myself. Um, again, I try not to 
uh, I try to refrain from too much of that because I think it's more important that we really see what God has to say and what God's uh, truth is on the matter. Um, a couple things I want us to think about um, in context of today's lesson, chapter 13, uh, as we go all the way back to chapter 1, and really this chapter even goes back to Genesis mm -hmm. and our our uh, interaction uh, with other uh, men and women and society in general and why government had to be established. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it also teaches us we do have a knowledge of good and evil and even governments through the law of God, through laws of nature, know something about good and evil. Um, but citizens, so today believers should seek to represent Christ well in their communities and the world. Uh, you got to remember, and I want to set the stage here a little bit, that Paul is writing about citizenship and how we should, out of our Christianity, mm -hmm. again, going back through the gospel lens, everything that we see in Romans is through that chapter one, the gospel, mm -hmm. clearly presented. Um, uh, the, the Roman uh, church, uh, most of them had not ever heard Paul preach. Uh, so when he wrote the letter to the church at Rome, um, it, we have the most complete uh, picture and testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ contained in Romans mm -hmm. as Paul would have preached to churches all around. In other letters, he admonishes, he corrects, he uh, reminds them of things that he had preached to them. And so we see snippets of, of what he preached, yeah. but here in Romans, we see exactly how he would have preached in, for those many years as he uh, traveled around. Um, but we see a man who is writing the Word of God from prison, you know, imprisoned. And I want you to remember that as we study about citizenship. And we're talking about a man who is writing uh, these words from uh, imprisonment. And the reason he is imprisoned is... For preaching the word of God. Exactly. So that in context we need to remember as we think about these words today. I will read uh, Herschel Hobbes uh, just an intro to chapter uh, 13 1 through 7 uh, Christian and citizenship and, and Herschel Hobbes says the Christian is a citizen of two kingdoms the kingdom of God and the earthly nation of which he is a part and he is to be a good citizen of both. Christianity was born in an empire of tyranny. It has lived under every type of government, and I would say it's thrived mm -hmm. under every type of government, including communism. Uh, there, there, no doubt, gospel, the gospel went forward even in those tyrannical types of government. Mm -hmm. While the believer may not agree with the governmental philosophy of, uh, or policies of his nation, and you know, Daniel talked about the ideal. Yeah. The ideal is what we present in our, our faith and our belief system, the Baptist faith message, the ideal. Uh, we might not agree with that. Uh, he is to be a good citizen of it, so long as the law does not violate his conscience before God. The Christian should obey it. Uh, even if he defies such a law, and we'll talk a little bit about that today, uh, he should be prepared and willing to endure the consequences of his allegiance to God. And Peter even talks about uh, when we do suffer at the hands of the government for our belief and for our faith, we should do so as Christians, not as criminals. Right. And there's a clear distinction. Yes. And that is very difficult for us in our human nature to accept. Um, the other thing I would say, and we certainly are going to refrain from diving into politics in any way this morning, but I will say in a season of election, uh, uh, government elections, we have elections all the time, every year, you know, we go through this. And this was a, this was a little bigger than the, the average because you got a presidential election and many senators are, are running for re-election and, and, and have opponents. Uh, when we find ourselves in this season, I did read an article back, I think it was at the end of 2019, and uh, man, it was a good reminder, a 
be careful, <laughs> you know. And again, Romans, everything through that gospel lens, be careful that you don't let the political season and uh, fightings with, with other people, uh, arguments with other people, really take away from your witness mm -hmm. and, and the message of Christ. So I think that's a couple things I just wanted to point out before we you know, kind of yeah, dive absolutely. into uh, religious liberty. So religious liberty is the key doctrine. And again, uh, civil government being ordained of God it is the duty of Christians to render loyal obedience. And we're going to talk about what that means. Thereto in all things, not contrary to the revealed will of God. We know uh, God's precepts and providences that we find in the word of God. And that becomes our conscience. We uh, do not have to subject ourselves to government when when. Uh, you know, and we need to be careful how we do that. But we uh, we should not sin because our government is telling us to do right. a certain thing. Just like bow before this God back in in ancient times, bow before Baal or bow before you know Caesar. That's what to say. This yeah. time it was Caesar. They yeah. had to say Caesar was God, and, and we should not have. We should not do that. No, and, and you see that all through Scripture that. They didn't. Right. What did Daniel do when he when they said you cannot pray? Mm -hmm. He went to the lions den. Right. What did the apostles do when they got called before the Sanhedrin twice mm -hmm. and, and threatened with death? They said we must in Acts five we must honor God before men. So the. These, these men in the Bible, it is continually over and over and over and over again when that conscience is violated. And we're going to talk about that much more in depth when we start getting into these verses. When that conscience is violated, it, it, it it's a different story. You have to honor God. You have to honor God first. God is responsible for government. He set up government. It's one of the three things that he set up. He set up the family, he set up the government, and he set up the church. It's one of the three things that God set up. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we can't say Caesar is God. Mm -hmm. We can't do all that. He does ordain government. and He doesn't necessarily set up every leader, but he does ordain that government should exist and that government should happen. But he is not responsible for the sin of tyrants. Right, and we have seen numerous times, Daniel, that God uses the good things and the bad things mm -hmm. to to bring about His perfect will. Yeah. So uh, we know that that both good and bad will exist in in authority. Uh, Jesus gave the perfect example when He was talking um, uh, to Pilate there that. Uh, really, you would have no authority, but God give it to you. Yes, and I didn't quote that exactly, but yes, but that is one of the uh, the perfect example of understanding Jesus recognized government even in his earthly mm -hmm. ministry up until death, and he was getting ready to be hung on a cross. Yep. So, uh, giving that perfect example, Paul, the apostle, had endured so much pain and suffering uh, in his life and ministry. Uh, even before being in prison, but as in, he was in prison, uh, no doubt suffered, um, you know, loneliness <laughs> and uh, isolation. Mm -hmm. But we are so thankful because in his imprisonment, we have m much of the New Testament provided to us. And you have to wonder if he would have actually had time, being a gospel soul winner, <laughs> if he'd had time to even write the, the, the letters yeah. had he been traveling all over the world. So, you know, out of that imprisonment, we actually, it has impacted generations upon generations since. So let's go ahead and dive in and, and we'll dissect uh, these first seven verses. I'll read those. Uh, let everyone submit to the governing authorities, since there is no authority except uh, from God. And the authorities that exist are instituted by God. So then, uh, the one who resists the authority is opposing God's command, and those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror uh, to good conduct, conduct, but to bad. Do you want to be afraid of the authority? Uh, do what is good, and you will have its approval. Uh, 
for it is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, because it, it, it does not carry the sword for no reason. For it is God's servant, an avenger, that brings wrath uh, on the one who does wrong. We'll go ahead and read 5 through 7. Therefore, you must submit not only because of wrath, but also because of your conscience. Um, and for this reason, you pay taxes, since the authorities are God's servants continually attending to these tasks. Uh, pay your obligations to everyone, taxes to those you owe taxes, tolls to those you owe tolls, respect to those you owe respect, and honor to those you owe honor. Mm -hmm. I'm going to turn it over to you, Daniel, for well, some more commentary. Well, in this section, um, we're going to talk about today, we're going to go all the way to verse 14, but in this section, we see four reasons why that Christians must be in subjection to the laws of the state. And in this section we just read here, we see the first two. Um, the first one we're gonna talk about is for wrath's sake. And that's verses one through four. You see that in there. Um, the first thing we've got to remember here is God established the governments of this world. We talked about that. Uh, we see that in Genesis 9, right after the flood. God set up governments of this world. Uh, Acts 17, it's pointed out again. Romans 13 here, it's pointed out. It, it's all throughout Scripture that God set up government. So we know that. But he's not responsible for their sin. And, and Daniel 4 gives us that picture with Nebuchadnezzar, what happened to him. He went mad when God removed his power from him. And it says all through that, that section of Daniel, God removed Nebuchadnezzar's power and his authority from him. So, yes, God does set these the, these governments up and he sets them up to do um, to have authority and to rule over people the first reason is for wrath's sake so if you're going to resist the law you're going to invite punishment on yourself and that's what he's saying here verses 1 through 4 um, but what he's saying here is the only ones that really should fear it that should fear uh, the government are the ones who break the law. If we do right, we don't have anything to fear. Now, you could say, well, that's not always true throughout history. It's not even true right now in communist China, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you're right. And we'll get into that in just a minute when, when it violates conscience. We still don't have anything to fear, though. No, no, we don't. So have it, doesn't take, it doesn't change that statement. And we'll, we'll get into that more when we get down here into verse 5 when it talks about conscience. About uh, It says, therefore you must submit not only because of wrath, but also because of your conscience. We'll talk about that conscience. Um, but God established government because man is a sinner. God established government out of his wrath. And we see that in 1 Samuel 8 when he gives Israel a king for the first time. He, he, he set it up out of his wrath, out of um, judgment. Judgment, yeah. I mean, because we sinned, we have to have something that rules over us. We have to have something that is authoritative in this world. Um, God is a sovereign God, but God is also not ruling over this world for the trivial things like he lets man rule over. I, I, I Personally, I don't believe that. He, he's not going, if it's trivial, he's going to let man have it. And, and really, we in our fleshly bodies don't think of it as trivial, but we don't have the mind of God where he could think certain things are trivial. Um, but... Um, You can make an argument also in Genesis 9 for capital punishment and by this verse for capital punishment. I'm not going down that rabbit hole. I'm not touching that. Not today, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but I'm just going to I'm just going to throw that out there and put point and, and put that out there. Um, this verse right here, this section right here, is where a lot of people argue capital punishment, and it goes back to Genesis 9, what we were talking about with the establishment of government. Um, 
and I'm not getting into it. <laughs> but we can take a couple of thou shalt not kill murder yeah. and thou shalt not steal, for instance. Right. And even in tyrannical, tyrannical government styles, those are two crimes mm -hmm. that are typically handled by the government. There are punishments, and so that's kind of what I think Paul is telling us, that, yeah, you know, even, even the worst of governments are there for wrath upon our sin. Yeah. And that sin, those are just two commandments that we could point to. Adultery, I think society is, mm -hmm. is uh, government has kind of stayed out of the adultery business. Yeah. But, but stealing and murdering still, even in our country, it's still crimes against humanity. So mm -hmm. those are dealt with by the government, by right. the establishment. Right. Um, in saying all that for, for wrath's sake, uh, why we should follow the government, um, I will say this, even though we can't always respect the man that's in office, we have to respect the office as Christians. The Christian thing to do is to respect the office, to respect the authority that has been given government by God, because it is God ordained. Um, but just because we respect that office, or we respect, even if we respect the man that's in that office, we don't always agree with him. We we're not always going to agree with him, and we're getting ready to get into that conscience that we're going to talk about. Um, one thing that we have to do for these rulers, though, and we are commanded in the Bible to do, is to pray for them. Yeah. First Timothy two one through two, yeah. and we are commanded to be a good citizen. That's First Peter two twelve through seventeen. Mm -hmm. So. We have to honor them. We have to pray for them. We have to care for them, and we have to want them to. We have to want them to honor God and want them to succeed. We we must do that. The second reason that we have to obey this government in this this passage here is for conscience' sake, and that's this is the big one. This is the one um, where you start seeing disagreement. In government, there's some people out there right now that um, will say, "Well, it is godly to be an anarchist. It is godly to be a terrorist." Even that's not what the way that the Christian is supposed to act and supposed to react. Even if our conscience is violated, that's not the way that we're supposed to act. Uh, that's one of the reasons that. Um, Radical Islam and is Islamic terrorism has hurt the world view of Islam. You, you, there's people that will not listen to a, a, a Muslim preacher or, or a Muslim convert, but simply because of the radical view of Islam and the terroristic style of Islam. If we behave that way as Christians, it goes back to what you were talking about. That ruins our witness that ruins our ability to communicate, that ruins our ability to reach people. So don't be an anarchist, don't be a radical. And I think it helps to remember our purpose as Paul lays out in Romans uh, as Christians is to spread yeah. the gospel. It all ties back, it all begins and ends with the gospel of mm -hmm. the Lord Jesus Christ. So, you know, when we think of it that way, that will change our decision making. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it'll change how we act and react yeah. to things around us when we purely look through the, the gospel lens. Yeah, I mean, look, looking back at these first verses, anybody can obey the law because they're um, because they're scared of being punished. Anybody can do that. We're different. We're Christians. We have a moral compass, a moral conscience that is guided by the Spirit of God. That's why we have to obey the law. And that's what Paul is saying here in 5 through 7. Um, specifically in verse 5, though, um, we ought to obey the law because of our moral conscience. Um, we talked about that earlier, about in earlier lessons, about how uh, the Christian's conscience is guided by the Holy Spirit and by the Word of God. Uh, that's why it's so important to study the Word of God. Paul was extremely 
extremely worried about keeping a good conscience before men uh, and before God. And he, he talks about it multiple verses. Um, just some of the ones that I've noted here. Acts 23.1, Acts 24.16, 2 Corinthians 1.12, 2 Corinthians 4, 2, 2 Corinthians 5, 11, 1 Timothy 1, 5, 1 Timothy 3, 9, 2 Timothy 1, 3. Paul talks about in all of these verses how important it is to keep a good conscience before God and before men. And, and we have to obey these leaders because of our obligation to God himself. Um, but what, I, I'm going to ask this, what if the Christian's moral conscience, which is the laws of God, the Word of God, the Holy Spirit of God, and the laws of the rulers, they clash. Well, what do we do then? Because that, that's the catch-22. That's, that's a question that is asked all the time today, and that's a question that's asked multiple times in the Bible. Um, You see so many, and we've talked about this in previous lessons, you can't compartmentalize these two worlds. Yes, like Herschel Hobbes said there, we are citizens of two worlds, but you can't compartmentalize them. Um, no one can serve two masters. So you have to learn which one you're going to have to serve. Um, and we see that question answered. Who are we going to honor? Who are we supposed to honor? Acts 5, 25 through 32. I, I, I'm going to go over here and I'm just going to read a little snippet of what happened here in Acts 5. Um, and, and I'm not going to start on 25, I don't think, because that goes a long way. What's happened here is, is this is the second time that that the apostles have been called before the Sanhedrin. I'll start in verse 29. And, and uh, Peter's going to answer in verse 29. They said, didn't we, uh, didn't we strictly order you not to teach in his name? The Sanhedrin, the high priest, asked Peter this, and here's his reply. But Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom you had murdered by hanging him on a tree. God exalted this man to his right hand as ruler and savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. So Peter's pretty bold right here. Not only did he get hauled in and arrested for preaching the gospel, he preached the gospel to the people that arrested him. <laughs> he's, he's pretty bold. But notice the change in Peter. Um, when they came to arrest Jesus, he drew the sword yeah. and cut off an ear and ready to take up arms and be that rebel, <laughs> that renegade. Uh, but here his sword changes to the very word. Yeah. Uh, preaching the gospel became his sword. Right. The sword <laughs> and that's spirit. really what Paul is describing in how we should present the gospel, uh, not as renegades. Yeah. I, I mean... They weren't renegades, but they still didn't apologize no. for preaching the gospel. No. And, and they weren't going to apologize for preaching the gospel. Like you said, they're they not... They were punished. They were punished. They, they were, were punished. absolutely punished. Uh, but they, they weren't going to apologize for it. God had the authority here. And, and, and the rulers, the Sanhedrin, were stepping into the business of God rather than what they were appointed to rule over, which is the government of this world, the government of the people, um, and the affairs of, of men. So they had stepped into the wrong, into the wrong world. Um, another thing, another place in the Bible, and, and this is one that almost everybody can quote, almost everybody can quote this verbatim. I've heard it so many times, stuff that out of context, in context, it doesn't matter. Matthew twenty-two twenty-one. 21. This is the very question that the Pharisees, who are we to honor? The Pharisees and the Herodians come after Jesus and try to trip him up with this exact same question. 
and, and this is the render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Um, a lot of people quote this. Even non-Christians can recite this. But this is a scripture that is of great, great, great importance to our understanding of conscience, of religious liberty. Um, Jesus states, and it's like Herschel Hobbes said there, this is the point where Jesus states, we are citizens of two kingdoms. To render unto Caesar's what is Caesar's, and to render unto God what is God's. We are... We are citizens of two kingdoms. Um, this is a a basic Baptist doctrine, y'all. And I, I read the Baptist Faith and Message earlier for that reason. And make no mistake about it, it's a Baptist doctrine. It, it's 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 a Christian doctrine, but it's a Baptist doctrine too. Um, and it's the separation of church and state. And, and it's clear from the words here that Christ said that there is to be no union between church and state. And by church, I mean ecclesia, the Greek ecclesia, the body, the local body of baptized believers. And we'll, we can get into that. That's another lesson for another day. That's a hardcore Baptist doctrine. But um, get in short, what Jesus is saying here, give to God what is God's. If it's God's, give it to him. The church is God's. The Christian is God's. And, and you honor him above all else. But the state has authority too. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Render unto Caesar's what is Caesar's. He has authority too. Give them what they require unless it violates what is God's. Because God is, is ultimately more important. Um, and that, that leads us into the verses 6 and 7 here when he starts talking about paying your obligations and paying your taxes. And for this reason, you pay taxes since the authorities are God's public servants. Um, this is a sec this, what I read or what I talked about here in Matthew is a passage on taxes. Um, and Christ here, he, he's applying all of that to taxes and to the dealings with all men. Um, but verse 6 here points out, and Romans 13 points out taxes by name. But Paul goes deeper in verse 7. Um, pay your obligations to everyone. Taxes to those that you owe taxes. Tolls to those that you owe tolls. Respect to those you owe respect. And honor to those you owe honor. Um, we have an obligation to pay taxes. We have an obligation to respect our leaders. Um, we have an obligation to honor those leaders and our government um, because it is from God and we shouldn't dare violate our conscience by not doing that by not respecting them um, yeah Paul uses you know, the concept of indebtedness when he says you owe um, we are indebted uh, to these things and we in good conscience yeah must pay or must render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Yeah. Uh, and even when, and I, I can say personally, I don't agree with everything that our government spends mm -hmm. money on, uh, our tax money. <laughs> that is a pretty common theme, you know. Uh, and uh, I'm sure in that day, if you looked at taxes, what they were used for in support of, of Roman government and uh, conquering uh, people groups mm -hmm. and paying for the armies, uh, the mighty armies of the Roman government. Uh, many would have, in a Christian conscience, even not supported those things as well, but it's clear that taxes uh, are to be paid when mm -hmm. they're owed. So yeah. tax evasion is not biblical. No, it's <laughs> not. Um, yeah. We're, we're just supposed to, like you said, I don't agree with everything that our government does either, but at the same time, God has given them that authority. And as, and as long as they don't violate conscience, which the, our conscience is, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, as long as they don't violate the Word of God and, and the revealed will of God, like it said in the Baptist faith and message there, we've got to honor them. And we, we've got to give them what they're owed because they are set up by God. Ultimately, they are given that authority by God. So, um, 
moving on, we're going to read um, verses 8 through 10 here. And we're running out of time, so I'm going to try to fly through these pretty quick. I'll read through uh, verses 8 through 10 here. Uh, Do not owe anyone anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law, the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not covet. And any other commandment are summed up by this commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. So Paul's going a little bit deeper in being a good citizen now. He, he's, he's still talking about being a good citizen, but he's going even deeper into it. Love one another. That is the basic principle of Christianity. We have that out of the mouth of Christ. Paul is reiterating it right here in Romans. Love one another. John 13, 34, Christ said, The new commandment I give to you. Uh, we are to practice love. Now, if we practice love the way we were supposed to practice it, there wouldn't be any need for law. There wouldn't be any need for rulers. There wouldn't be any need for government. But we can't. We don't. We talked about that. We're sinners. Um, this is the main uh, message of the Sermon on the Mount. Love. There's a problem in the heart. Sin is a problem of the heart. Uh, if we love others, we will not sin against them. Uh, our motive for obeying God and, and helping others is the love of Christ in our own hearts. So, no, go ahead. And I want to point out, too, that this is saved and unsaved. Mm -hmm. uh, loving your neighbor means all of them. Yeah. <laughs> and there are uh, your white many, neighbor, your black neighbor, there, your gay neighbor. <laughs> there are many out there that would kind of withdraw into their little commune mm -hmm. of believers, uh, bottle the gospel up and and put it on a table in that center of the commune and mm -hmm. say, this is for us and we're just going to yeah. love each other and the rest of the world, you know, uh, you know that's not... That is not what he's talking about here. Loving one another means all people. Yep. Just as Christ loved all people. Right. Now I am going to go, I've got a little bit of time, so I am going to go down a little sidebar here. Verse 8 is one that a lot of people will say, well, this, this is talking about financial practices. This is not talking about financial practices. Um, when it says, do not owe anyone anything. Um, the Bible does not forbid borrowing or uh, legal financial transactions that involve interest. It, it, it doesn't. Uh, is it a good idea? Maybe not. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But <clears throat> what the Bible does forbid is charging high interest, robbing your brothers, uh, failing to pay honest debts. We see that in Exodus 22 and Nehemiah 5. Um, Nobody should go into unnecessary debt. I'm not making that case, but that's not what this is talking about. There's a lot of people that really push that. And, and, and um, they make, if you make Romans 13 8 apply to financial obligations, in my opinion, you're going to get some of my opinion here. You're stretching a point. That's just the way I would feel about it. Um, but in this section right here, 8 through 10, Paul is centered on the problem that has plagued us since the fall of man, the human heart, and, and, and what it is to love, and because that's our primary duty. Because we were sinful, that's why God established government, and, and the laws of this world, y'all, cannot change the heart. They cannot do it. Only the grace of God can do that. And... and that's what Paul is, is trying to point out here. If we show that kind of love, then we can extend God's grace to people. We can, we can got people get a glimpse of what the grace of God really is. Um, yeah, the, we actually see the, and I think the most profound statement here to me is love therefore is the fulfillment of the law. Yeah. And uh, man, for the believer, 
uh, that is that is awesome. Yeah. Uh, to know that we have fulfilled the law through this love as it's described here, mm-hmm. and that comes through the grace of God uh, and the gospel uh, is is the genesis of that in our hearts. Yeah. So, circumcision of the heart. Yeah. All right, uh, finishing up the reading this morning, uh, verses 11 through 14. Go ahead, John. All right. Besides this, since you know the time, uh, it is already the hour for you to wake up from your from sleep because now is our salvation is nearer than when we first believe. Uh, he's talking about living in the end times, and Paul uh, knew that some generation would be alive when Christ returned. Yeah. And there are times when you think he felt like it was his generation and maybe he uh, actually thought about a time when maybe he would die before Christ returned. But nevertheless, he is going back to Jesus' uh, commandment is that wake up. Yep. Uh, the time is near. The night is nearly over and the day is near. So let us discard the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk with decency as in the daytime, uh, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual impurity and promiscuity, uh, not in quarreling and jealousy, uh, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and don't make plans to gratify the desires of the flesh. Yeah. Um, Just running through this real quick because we are about out of time. Um, Paul here is pleading us... um, to do three things and and he he wants us he's calling on us to do three things and the first one is to wake up and we see that Um, to wake up that implies spiritual readiness he's talking about the end of times but to be ready and the next thing he wants us to do is to clean up to clean up and, and to wear the armor of Christ what is the armor of Christ? Well, go to Ephesians chapter 6 and Paul lists it for you in verses 11 through 17, the full armor of God. That is the armor of light that he's talking about here. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and to behave, conduct yourself like a Christian, to clean up, to put off all of this, this, this ungodly stuff. Live holy. That's what he's saying here. And the last thing he calls us to do is to grow up and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It means to become more like Christ, to receive by faith all that he has for our daily lives. Um, We grow on the basis of the food that we eat, and, and that's why we're not to make plans to satisfy the flesh. Um, if we feed the flesh, we will fail. But if we feed the spirit, and we feed, um, if we feed ourselves with the nourishing things of the spirit of God, of the word of God, we will ultimately succeed. We will be good citizens. We will be good Christians, and, and, and we will spread the gospel of Christ throughout the world. Um, Christians should be the best citizens. We really should. Um, We may not always agree on politics. We may not always agree on political parties. Um, But we can and we must agree on our attitude and what our attitude should be towards government. we're, we're We're called to do that. Um, to be good citizens and to have a good attitude towards the government. Um, I will say this, if you want to look into this more and, and, and what this church has, what this church believes on religious liberty, there's some documents down here in the Sunday school office. If you want a set of them, I'll get them for you. Uh, we address them in our constitution, our church constitution. We address uh, religious liberty, particularly in Article 10. Uh, of our Articles of Faith and on Article 4 of uh, Baptist Polity, Church Polity. We address all that. I encourage you to read that. Um, I encourage you to get a copy of the Baptist Faith and Message. I encourage you to read all this in, in, in Romans chapter 13 again. Um, 
we need to be good citizens and we need to be good Christians. If you want to look up historical documents, the Schleichheim Confession addresses this. The Waterlander Confession addresses this. The New Hampshire Confession of Faith addresses this. So th this is stuff that we have a lot of writing on as, as Baptists. If you want to learn more about the historical part of it, go to the church website and read the blog post that I put out about a month ago. Uh, we walked through it. But ultimately, realize that Baptists and, uh, and us as Christians should want to have a good relationship with the state as long as they honor God and as long as they're doing what God wants us to do and behaving the way God wants us to behave. Anything else this morning, John, before we get out of here? Well, so, uh, yeah, just thinking about Romans chapter 13, uh, you know, Paul really sums up uh, what we're experiencing in these, in these days. Mm -hmm. uh, he talks to him, talking about being a citizen and uh, uh, honoring the authorities in our lives, uh, but also recognizing the end of days, mm -hmm. uh, recognizing and being ready and, and putting on love, uh, putting on the full armor. Uh, you know, Herschel Hobbes said, one may pay his taxes in full, uh, but the demands of Christian love can never be fully paid. Amen. So the Christian is obligated to love his neighbor. Uh, it says the debt of love remains with us permanently and never leaves us. Uh, this is a debt with uh, which we both discharge every day, but forever owe. And then the, never, the debt can never be paid off, but we should keep the interest paid. That's right. I think that's a pretty <laughs> that's a good, good way to end uh, today's lesson. But I think it's this chapter thirteen, man. It's been more applicable to what we're experiencing today mm -hmm. than probably anything we've studied this far. But in Romans, but very thankful for Romans mm -hmm. uh, and the study of Romans during these times we're in. I think it's been a godsend, yep. as we've mentioned before, to have Romans uh, to look to for guidance on how we are to behave. Yep. Uh, in this day and time. So with that, let's go ahead and end in prayer. Uh, Lord Jesus, we're thankful for this day. God, for the many blessings, Lord, that you've given us for the opportunity to study your word and spirit and in truth um, and to know, Father, that you are God today and forevermore uh, and that you are the Almighty uh, and that uh, you are with us, ever-present, and help us uh, make better decisions in our daily lives than we could ever make alone. Uh, so uh, pray, Father, that you would go with us, lead God and direct us, uh, go with today's service, uh, be with the seniors. Uh, uh, graduating seniors, uh, been a, a different kind of uh, school year. Uh, don't know that we'll ever see another one like it, but uh, Father, we're just so thankful for each and every one of them, and, and we just pray that you would bless them in the days to come and that you would uh, show them the path that you would have for each of them. Uh, in Jesus' name we ask. Amen.